Are the following functions? Is this circle a function? No. Why not? No. Yeah, it fails the vertical line test with a zero. It, is, it does not pass. What about number two? Yeah, number two is a function, right? That passes the vertical line test. Uh, is number three a function? Yeah, number three is a function, right? Zero, one, two, three, four. No repeating x value, so yes, this is a function. Okay, so let's go back and list the domain and range. So for the circle, the domain, since this is continuous, goes from 0 to 6. So 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 6. And the range, so the domain goes from here to here, the range goes up from 0 to also 6. You would imagine in a circle those should be the same. Yeah. So the range goes from 0 to 6 as well. For number 2, there's no arrows on this line, so we can't really assume that it's going to go beyond what is given. So we're just going to take what is given when we try to write the domain and range here. The domain will go from 0 to, all right, we're counting by 30s here, so the last one would be 210. And the range would go from 0 to, this is going by 50s, so 0 to 350. Now in a discrete situation like number three, recall that you write it a little differently. You just list out all the numbers. So the domain for number three is zero, one, two, three, and four. And the range is zero, three, six, nine, and 12. By the way, pretty frequent, now that you, we've sort of dealt with domain and range a little bit, I'm gonna start writing them as just D and R. And, and hopefully you kind of know what that means. All right, so let's go back to what we were talking about um, in the introduction, which is independent and dependent variables. So the independent variable is the one that represents your input, independent input. They both start with in, yeah? independent input. The variable that represents the input values is the independent variable. Okay, the one that represents the outputs is the dependent variable. So like we said before, the independent variable is typically your x, and your dependent variable is typically y. So when these variables actually you know, stand for something, Sometimes it can be a little tricky to figure out what depends on what, but for the most part, I'm not going to try to give you really tricky ones. Um, they should all be, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. The amount of your paycheck depends on how many hours you worked, uh, assuming you get paid hourly. The cost of a speeding ticket depends on how fast you were going, the speed you were traveling. The height of the grass in your yard depends on how often you water it or how much rain you get. And your grade depends on your effort, usually. Yeah. All right, any questions so far before we start jumping into examples? All right, so we've got the function y equals 12x represents the number of pages a computer printer can print in X minutes. So just so we understand the situation here, uh, Y equals 12X, how many pages can the printer print in, a, in one minute? 12. 12, right? Yeah, because it's, you basically are multiplying 12 pages by the number of minutes. Okay, so we need to identify the independent and dependent variables here. So the independent, is the, what is the independent variable here? What does x represent? 
the number of minutes, right? And what depends on that? What's the other variable? What's the Y variable here? Number of pages, good. Okay, so this is where we're gonna use the calculator. Part B says the domain is one, two, three, and four. What's the range? Okay, so domain. Is domain the X values or the Y values? X. So basically what we need to do is set up a little table where we've got X and Y, where X is one, two, three, and four, and we need to calculate the Y values. That will be our range. If this is the domain, then the range will be whatever the Y values are that are so associated with this. Now you could probably do this in your head, the numbers are pretty small, but I wanna show you how to just quickly do it in the calculator. So either get your calculator ready, or if you don't have one, just scoot ne next to someone and watch them do it. Before you do anything, and this is just like sort of rule of thumb, anytime you start using these calculators, clear the memory, because you, you know we're doing other stuff in pre-calculus where we're messing with settings, you want just sort of the default settings for everything. So you're going to hit second plus 712. And it'll say RAM cleared. Okay? That way you just get like an off the shelf calculator. Does anyone need help clearing their memory? Okay. Go ahead and hit the Y equals button. This is where we're going to type in our equation. So hit Y equals, and we'll type in our equation. It's Y equals 12X. So we'll hit 12, 1, 2, X. So the X button, your independent variable button, is this button right here that says X comma T comma theta comma N. So 12X. Do you all know how to get to the table from here? Or, or not really? You used to? Yeah, exactly right. So you hit second graph. Notice that right above graph, it says table in blue letters. Anything, any of these functions that are in blue letters, you have to hit the second button first. Now, all of our inputs here are integers, so we don't really need to do anything more. But there is a way where you can sort of make a custom table. So I want to just show you how to do that in case like your, your domain are, are decimals. Okay, so even though we don't really need it for this particular problem, you might need it for a future problem. So the way you do that is you want to change the table settings. So to get to the table settings menu, you hit second, window. Notice right above the window button in blue it says table set. That means table settings. Okay. And the only thing we're going to change here is we are going to change the independent variable from auto, so it'll just like automatically do all the integers, to ask. We want the calculator to ask us which values to use for our independent variable, our x. Am I going too fast? Okay, so now go back to your table. Second table and it'll be blank. You might be thinking, well, I just had all the answers. Whoa, what good was that? Well, what's happening here is now you can input any number you want into X. So the only X's I really care about are one, two, three, and four. So I'm gonna type those in, one, two, three, and four. And it gives me the Y values. So I'm gonna write those down, 12, 24, 36, 48. That will be my range, with just those values. So my range is 12, 24, 36, and 48. Any questions about that one? All right, let's go to the next one. The function T equals 19M plus 65 represents the temperature of an oven after preheating it for M minutes. Identify the independent and dependent. Okay, so what's the independent variable here? Minutes. 
minutes, right. So the temperature depends on how long the oven's been preheating. So that time is your independent variable. Even though there's not a Y and an X here for us to reference, you know, we've got T and M. These are sort of playing the roles of Y and X here to kind of help you decide what one, what's independent and what's dependent. So yeah, the independent variable here is the number of minutes. And by the way, here's another little tip if you're trying to decide. Not always, but most of the time, if there is some kind of unit that represents time, that is typically independent. There's not a whole lot of things that time depends on, right? I mean, I don't know. Can you even think of any? So what's the dependent variable? <clears throat> the temperature of the oven, right. Okay, so the first, the next question is about the domain and range. Okay, so let's think about domain. So let's talk about domain and range here. Okay, so if domain is referring to all our possible independent values, the number of minutes, what is the fewest number of minutes I could possibly preheat the oven for? You, you couldn't do less than five minutes? Zero, right? You couldn't do fewer than zero minutes. Yeah, okay. So the domain would be zero is less than, now normally we would write x here, but we don't have an x. What variable are we using instead of x for this one? M. M. So zero is less than or equal to m, which is less than or equal to, what would be the maximum? We don't really know that yet. We, we have to figure that out, okay? We'll come back to that. The range would be all the possible um, temperatures, right? So like if you uh, preheated this oven for zero minutes, what would the temperature of the oven be? It would be zero? Room, sort of room temperature basically. What we can do is use the function that's given to determine that. So go back to your calculator. Go back to y equals. We can clear out the last equation. Let's type 19x plus 20, uh, 65, 19m plus 65, and go to the table. Now, we don't need any of these values necessarily, but what we want is to find out what's the temperature at zero minutes. Like if I had to plug in zero into this equation, what should it be? What's 19 times zero plus 65? Yeah, 65. And so that's what we should expect, 65. So the range will go from 65 degrees to what's the maximum? 550, then, and that's given to you. So the question is like, what's the, what's the domain here? Like, when does the temperature actually get to 550? And that's where we use the table, right? So take a guess. Let's see, you know, what, what, when do you think that'll happen? Give me a number of minutes when you think that might happen. It's okay to be wrong. We just need something, something to work with. Four minutes, let's see. So if four minutes, we'll be at 141 degrees. So probably bigger than that. So give me, a, give me another number. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, let's see 20 minutes. All right, 20, we need to go a little bit bigger, so 25, that's a good idea. Is that what we want? Oh, 550, we're almost there. 26, not 27, 28, 29. Okay, so it's definitely going to be in between 25 and 26, right? Oof. Should we start typing in decimals, or it might be easier to solve this algebraically. You know, how many minutes until you get to 550 degrees? Yeah, it'll be some sort of decimal, right? 
So let's solve this. 550 equals 19m plus 65. So this is going back to like the second day of school. How do we solve this? Subtract 65 from both sides. Good. Oh, I need a better pen here. So 550 minus 65. Yeah, I'm using the calculator here to figure that out. 485. So 485 equals 19m. Right. Divide by 19. So m is. Oh wow, this is like a terrible number here. About 25 and a half minutes, roughly. So we'll just say approximately 25.5. Yeah, it, it'll be a it'll be a weird fraction. There's no like perfect number there. I mean, this is this is the number, right? It's that 25.526. <laughs> All right. Let's do one more. The function C equals 100 plus 0 .30m represents the cost in dollars of renting a car after driving m miles. All right. If this is x and this is y, so, or playing the role of x and y, what's the independent variable? So you've got cost and miles. Miles, yeah. So the number of miles. The dependent variable. Let's scoot this up a little bit. Is the uh, yeah the cost. Okay, so those are our independent dependent variables. What would be the cost to rent the car and drive a hundred miles? So, how would we answer that? How do we determine the cost? Yeah. Where, where are we going to put this 100 in the equation? For m, right? This is going to be our m. So the cost would be 100 plus 30 cents times 100. All right. And let's go ahead and figure out what that would be. Just type that in here. 100 plus 30 cents for, per mile for 100 miles. So I get 130. So the cost is $130. How many miles would a customer have to drive for the cost to be $149.50? Well, that would be a cost, right? So we're going to plug that into C and solve for M. So 149.5 equals 100 plus 0.3. 0 times m. Alright, how do we solve this? Good, subtract 100. Get 49.5 equals 0 0.30 m. Good, divide. I'm doing all the arithmetic here in the calculator. 49.5 divided by 0 0.3, 165. So, 165 miles. Any questions so far? So now that we've talked about independent and dependent variables, we're going to sort of shift gears here and talk about linear functions. Okay, This is something you probably talked about in eighth grade. Um, I can't guarantee that, but uh, I think so. So this should be sort of familiar. A linear function has what we call a constant rate of change.
okay? The graph of all linear functions, are, they'll be lines. In fact, that's where the word linear is rooted, right? It's a line function. Now, there is one line that is not a function, and that's a vertical line. So if you have a vertical line, it is still linear, but it is not a function. So we don't consider it a linear function. A nonlinear function does not have a constant rate of change. So the graph is not a line. So let's, let's run through sort of the easy ones here, and then I'll show you how to determine whether the harder ones are linear or not. So the real question is, you know, how do we determine whether or not the function has a constant rate of change? So to answer that, we need to answer what is rate of change? Okay, so rate of change is the change in x divided by the change in, oh, I got that backwards, wow. The change in y divided by the change in x. So if we have to calculate it, that's what we're gonna do. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that. If we're just looking at a graph, the real question is, is it a line? Okay, like it's a straight line with, with no variation. So number seven, is that linear or not? No, that is nonlinear. No, it does not. Um, so if it goes through zero, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the year, uh, that means that the linear function has what we call direct variation, which is probably what you're thinking about. So we'll get into that in the next unit. But a linear function itself does not need to go through zero. Number eight, is that linear? Yes. All right, we'll skip the tables. We'll come back to those in just a moment. Let's do the graphs first because they're way easier. You just tell by looking at them. Uh, number 11, is that linear? No, right? Like, not only is it not a line, but, like, these are not the same rates of change. So this is nonlinear. Wow, I can't spell today. All right, number 12, is that linear? It looks like it might be linear, but if you look a little closer, you're gonna find out that it's not. Because let's look at the rate of change from point to point to point. So the change in Y over the change in X. Back when in eighth grade, when you talked about slope, you probably talked about rise over run. And that's the same way that we can calculate rate of change. That is the change in Y over change of X. And that rate of change needs to be constant in order for it to be a linear function. That is the defining characteristic of a linear function is that the rate of change is constant. So like if I look at like the first point to the second point, I'm going up three over two, right? Up three over two. So my rate of change would be three halves. But if I go from the next, the second point to the third point, what's the rate of change there? Two over two, which is one. But all we really care about is whether or not the rate of change is constant. So is it constant here? No, because these two numbers are not the same. So this is nonlinear. That's how we're, this approach of actually checking the rate of change from point to point to point is how we're going to determine whether or not a table or a, a list of points can, uh, makes a linear function. So let's, let's start working on those. Let's look at number nine. What we want to do is check the rates of change. So I'm, uh, first I'm just going to find all the changes in x and all the changes in y, and then we'll, we'll see whether or not it's constant. So for number 9, my changes in x is plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. My change in y is plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. So if I'm looking from point 1 to point 2, my rate of change is 3 over 1. So that's the first rate of change. These are my rates of change. What's the second change? Once again, 3 over 1. And once again, on the third one's 3. So is it constant? Yes. If, if all of those are equal, then you can say, yes, we do have a linear function. For 
for number 10. Let's check the change in x's first. We've got plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. And for the change in y's, we've got minus 1, plus 1, plus 3. So if I'm checking each individual rate of change, my rates are going to be negative 1 over 1, positive 1 over 1, and 3 over 1. Are those all the same? Obviously not. Right? So we can say that this is not linear, non-linear. When you get a list of points here, what I will typically recommend is to rewrite it as a table. So it's just easier to compare the numbers, I think. So I'm going to rewrite number 13 as a table just to make my life a little bit easier. So I've got my x's are 2, 0, negative 3, negative 5, and my y's are 8, 6, uh, 4, and 0. All right, so I'm going to check my rates of change here. The change in y here is minus 2, and it's going to be the same for all of these. All right, minus, oh, nope, nope. Not all of them. This one's minus 4. Now, right away, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is not linear. Okay, We need to check the rate of change, not just the change in one of the variables. For my x, I've got minus 2, minus 3, and then minus 2 again. So my rates of change are going to be negative 2 over negative 2, negative 2 over negative 3, and negative 4 over negative 2. Are these all the same number? No. So this is nonlinear. And for number 14, do kind of the same thing here. I'll start by reconstructing this function as a table just to make things a little bit easier to read. So here's my x and my y. My x's are negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. My y's are 7, 5, 3, and 1. So my change in x is plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. My change in y is minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. If you notice that these are all the same numbers, you kind of already know what the answer is going to be. Um, but it doesn't hurt to write them all down. So the rates are going to be negative 2 over 1, negative 2 over 1, negative 2 over 1. So is this linear? Yeah, yeah this is linear. So if you're looking at a picture, you don't necessarily need to find all the rates because it'll be pretty obvious. Just Is it a line or not? Um, but when you're dealing with points or a table, you, you do have to calculate those rates to make sure that they are in a line or not. Any questions?